Hi, John. Thanks for joining. Hi, Jacob. Thank well, you for having me. Welcome to Poland. <laughs> it's exciting to be here. It is. It is. It's a different environment this time. Uh, but I'm happy, you know, I, I just seeing the work and the trailers and everything that you've done. I was so excited to meet you. So it's awesome we're doing this here today. Thanks so much for sharing. Let's uh, watch the trailer. Why'd you settle here? Up at dawn, working the crops, rain or shine. You'll discover their source arrangements. If I was a good man, why? I ain't him. Stop fretting about it. You know I saw what's in the back of that closet. I've done things I wish I could take back. I best go look for the rider. Is he alive? Barely. What do you think happened? Some kind of shootout? Stay here and keep an eye on him. Hey, oh, my. Who the hell are you? My pa found you. Oh, go fetch him. What's wrong with my set? I don't know what you're talking about. You better think long and hard on what you got yourself into. Funny, I was about to tell you the same thing. Riders, there gonna be three of them. I'm Sheriff Sam Ketchum. We've been scouting for a man on the run. He's dangerous. They ain't lawmen, they bank robbers. Your last name McCarty? That's right. First name? Henry. Why they didn't shoot you dead, I don't know. I got this crazy idea. There might be more to old Henry than meets the eye. Some shaky old farmer? He didn't hold that pistol like any farmer I've ever seen. Listen to me. What's going to happen will happen quick. You got a lot of fight for a farmer. You have no idea the hell storm you're fixing to let loose. Consider me properly warned. Where'd you come from? Every place on earth but this. Who are you, Paul? How is it immersing yourself into a place, finding a location and deciding, okay, you're gonna shoot here, it's gonna take place, what happens during the days, the landscape? How did you make it your own? Yeah, um, Old Henry was such a special script because the director, Patsy Ponsoroli, had been, he'd been kind of scouting for a, for a different Western, and he kind of stumbled upon this location because they were looking for a house in this other film in the middle of nowhere, kind of surrounded by trees and the hills and everything, and I think a year and a half later, he sent me the script for Old Henry that was kind of really written around this location. Um, it had inspired him so much um, to do a whole film around it, you know, and it was also also something that was achievable, you know, on kind of, you know, a modest budget. And so we had a 3,000 acre property in which we could kind of put together this story. And so when our, you know, when the gunslingers are on the top of the hill, they are on the top of the hill, you can see them in the background. So we're really able to kind of connect things you know i think so often in independent films we're trying to piece things together location wise to try to get scope and stuff and so i think having basically every location be on that one property um, was really a dream you know every single day you'd go into work and you'd be at the one house and you know we had you know so it was um i don't know it became it became our home really um and then it became just a challenge i think to kind of reinvented every time too we're kind of like going into kind of the same interiors and stuff like that but i mean yeah it was uh it was such a fun experience kind of prepping the film because we spent probably two weeks just the director and i um you know just running around on four by fours and trying to figure out where everything's going you know we would take an afternoon and go figure out oh where is 
where's the camp scene going to be? And we would just kind of go around and explore. Um, so it was really a dream just to have this, this whole kind of blank canvas to kind of build and craft the story out of. How do you go about saying that you had to reinvent it for yourself, that it doesn't get boring right after some point? How did you go about that, not getting bored? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think in some of the, the prep that we do, I think we're always talking about where the story is going, you know, Potsy and I, and so we're just trying to visually make sure it's, it's interesting and, and change, changing it up in the perspective and being really aware of that on a scene-to-scene -scene basis. Because obviously you shoot things all out of order, but to kind of know where you're going and know, oh, if we've been doing wides from this kind of perspective, you know, uh, you know in the next scene, let's be sure to change it up if it makes sense. You know, because so, so much of our film happens in this, this really small cabin. Um, you know, and it, we ended up shooting a lot of room to room, which was, which was something we always wanted to do to kind of enhance this idea of, I don't know, just these people. This, this enhanced this idea of isolation, I guess. So it was all on location, all the inside stuff as well. That was in that cabin as well. Yeah, um, the whole thing on location. And what's really cool about this cabin is that it was actually one of the like, original homestead cabins on this property. So the cabin itself was from like 1860. So there was not a set built, that was there. There was an existing cabin, and then we are, Max Bisco, our production designer, did an amazing job kind of adding on to the back half of it, kind of built the farm out around it. And so we had great kind of, you know, structure to kind of work with. Um, and what was really cool is that it was, I feel it was built in such a holistic way because when we're building onto this cabin, they were, they were finding and getting wood from barns that had fallen down on that property. And so it's, the set was being built with wood that was 100 years old or 120 years old, which I think just kind of added to the texture overall. Um, yeah. yeah, it was really special. You know, I, I kept saying that art department were bringing in artifacts, not props, because I feel like everything in that cabin was from the time period, you know? That's amazing. It's all about the textures, right? They can do it. I mean, obviously textures, you need light and how that goes together. How did you get inspired or doing the inside stuff? Did you totally recreate it or were you using the natural light as well, supplementing it to the inside? Yeah, for our interiors, we re it was really, um, we were going for a very kind of naturalistic look, you know, because it was gray, kind of, the whole film happens kind of in a winter landscape. And so, really wanted to just kind of bring this soft light in from the windows and we're shooting in winter and there's very little daylight. And so, no, we pretty much all of our interiors were kind of, you know, Airy Max, Airy 360, um, tons of bounce light. My gaffer, Maddie Ware, just did an amazing job at somehow making five lights outside look like one big, beautiful soft light that wrapped exactly where you needed it to wrap. Um, so yeah, it was, yeah. Did you uh, jump inside and outside as well? Because it's always a challenge being on one location. You know, everything gets muddy, people walking in it and kind of still keeping it the way it was. Was that a challenge in terms of jumping? I feel like in terms of the production and going inside and outside, we tried to stay more in script order of things, more than interior to exterior. Just because the way kind of our cast was kind of coming to the table as well, you know, we had a few weeks with some of the actors, and then a couple of weeks is when the other actors kind of came into the picture. And so there were there's some sequences where we were inside outside, but we would owe a lot of our inside looking out shots and things like that. So that was kind of split up. We would kind of um, just kind of mix it up a little bit. Um, j just for me, it's, it's hard to imagine because I don't know the state so well w w where you were shooting. What is that like being in winter? What happens with the weather? What happens with the sun? How were you able to, you know, get that into the prep work done? Did you, were you know when you were shooting, what were you going to be running into? Yeah, it was, it was really challenging because you've got like, I think we had nine hours of daylight. And so every day we would, we would show up and it would be dark and then by the end of our you know by the time we wrap for the day it would be dark and so you're trying to find this window of time to shoot the exteriors when you need to um it's very challenging um because we're kind of it was kind of turning from fall into winter and so at the, at the beginning of the shoot we had days that were 80 degrees and sunny and by the end 
we had snow that we had to kind of move inside. We had to move our schedule around because it snowed a couple of days. So we had to shoot interiors, you know, and so um, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, I became very, very good friends with Dark Skies, the weather app, in terms of predicting clouds, which is really amazing. Um, because anytime, you know, we were really kind of, we didn't have a large kind of grip electric package. And so in terms of grip, grip stuff to be able to control our exterior. So we really were kind of having to adjust the schedule on a day-to-day -day basis at times to say, oh, if it's overcast in the afternoon, we'll do our exteriors. We'll maybe do some inside stuff in the morning. So it really had to be super adaptable um, and just had a great crew that kind of worked through all those elements. I mean, at, at one point we had a rainstorm come through and the quarter mile road from base camp to our set was like washed out. So everyone had to be like transport, you know, so we just, I feel like there was constantly, <laughs> constantly weather elements that were, that were a challenge. But at the same time, I think those elements kind of added, they added to that texture um, of the final look, I think, because then the ground's muddy, everyone, everyone's just feeling it a little bit more when they're cold, wet, and tired. They kind of feel maybe what our characters are feeling. And I feel like that just is, you know, that comes through in the film. Yeah. It's all you have to immerse yourself into it, right? So it's it's like, I think Terry Gilliam once said that, that what's, this, that what's actually happening on set becomes actually the story within the movie, or the opposite around, it just becomes one thing altogether. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, was it a lot of overcast, or was it like day, was it going from sun? Because there's very powerful, especially uh, when in, in the first shots, like the, the shadows are really blue, and the sun, was that grading? Because I'm just trying to understand what the skies were doing for you. Yeah, so a, a little in the grade in how we kind of kind of addressed our shadows, but I think also shooting in, in winter is such a, it's so, so great as a cinematographer to kind of get this, you know, even at, at noon, the sun's very low in the sky. Um, and again, I think it's just planning. It's about planning when your wide shots are, when your close-ups are. And I, I've, I was very, I feel like I was vocal about it, but then also was extremely supported by the director, the assistant director, in terms of saying, we're gonna do these close-ups now, but we're gonna hold our big wides to the end. And it's, it's hard to do that, because that, when the sun's in the right position for your wide shots on the exteriors. So it's hard to get everyone on the same page to do that, because it, it's, it's somewhat risky, because you're, you're, you're leaving less time to do those big, kind of crucial shots. Um, I think it just requires everyone to be, I guess, um, just super dialed in, so you all can kind of execute in that 30 or 45 minute window when the light's right. So basically you had control over the close-ups when you were in and you were keeping the, the wide shots when the light was in the right position or when the weather changed and then jump back and did the wides mm -hmm. for that. Uh, it's interesting. On interior work, do you work that way too? Or do you kind of start the w out from the wide? Same for lighting. I mean, how, how do you light the spaces to achieve close-ups and, and, and masters? Yeah, it's in, um, in terms of the interiors, that was like we were always starting with a, a big bounce source and then kind of, you know, wrapping it. You know, I think we started the film, well, first off, we did a fair amount of tests. We did a couple of days of kind of testing while we were in prep, just in terms of lighting. Like, what is, what is, what does a hard light look like in this room? What does a soft light look like in this room? Um, which was something I never had the luxury to do on a film, and I just fought to do it on this, and my gaffer just kind of went above and beyond. Because it's kind of insane to think that, you know, you write a film for two years, you prep it for months, and then you get on, on set, and you're like, cool, you've got an hour to light it, and then it's gonna like, then it's gonna be your, that image will live on forever with that one hour of lighting. And so, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of testing, even from a lighting perspective, uh, to see what works and what doesn't work. And so it was kind of trial and error a little bit, and then we kind of dialed in something that, that really worked for us. Can you talk a little bit about that test period of testing lights within that space? Yeah, we started doing, you know, we would do bounces, you know, kind of side bounces, or we would do like shelf, you know, kind of shelf bounces um, outside, trying to keep most of the lights outside. Um, I think initially I was thinking I would bring up the ambience inside um, just to kind of, because I wanted to see detail out the windows. That was a thing, a thing too on this, just kind of in this idea of, of being this kind of authentic approach or like this naturalistic feel. You know, I never wanted to feel anything was kind of heavy handed. 
And so with that, I wanted to be sure to see detail outside and not just have the windows burn out. And so it became this thing that we thought we were gonna raise the ambience of the room by certain things, like we tried ceiling bounces. We just tried a couple things for a couple days while we were doing um, hair and makeup tests and, and wardrobe tests and that kind of thing. So that's basically your replacing, because I think that's one of the most interesting things when, you, when you're working with bounces outside to figure out what the angle is, how you're gonna go into the room, because it's just so much about the window size, right? And what's mm -hmm. happening inside. Did you, were you trying to look for a style or were you trying to understand the spaces in, in relationship to the window size to just to see what you were able technically to do or were you looking for? I mean, this room in particular, I remember we were shooting in a different room and we looked back and then the sun happened to be in a certain position that kind of was kind of doing similar to what this was doing. <laughs> and so I immediately pulled my gaffer over and was like this we need to do something like this world the way the lights coming in at this angle and so then we kind of make a note of that and then when we go in to shoot there we would then put our our light outside to kind of recreate it from that angle so a lot of that was kind of just observing your location and kind of taking clues and hints from that um, i don't know how many times i'll do that even on a scout or even on a shoot day turn around and the, the light's doing something weird through a window or bouncing off here and then i just grab a quick photo of it on my phone even to just be like, oh, this is something we may want to try to replicate. I, I started that a few years ago, just panning the light around outside, just seeing what's happening inside to get a feel for it. It changes so much. You just learn how to see, you know, how the room will work. Because like this fall off here, what's happening here on the wall, is that color on the wall or were you actually adding different kinds of colors coming in? That again, kind of going back to this amazing location, you know, this this is one of the few rooms in the in, in the cabin that we didn't. I don't think we, I think they pulled off some wallpaper that had been there, or some older wallpaper that they pulled off. And so what you maybe have is some glue residue, but it works, you know. It, I remember at one point they said, "Do you want to just kind of paint it so it's all one thing?" And the, dire the director and I were like, "Absolutely not! Like this is great." And so you know, it's just that kind of inherent texture. This, this room in particular was such a joy to film in. We even moved a couple scenes that were supposed to be in other parts of the house back into this room, even though this was one of the smallest rooms. And, and but sorry, but the, uh, the window placement here was great because I, I didn't have this burden of trying to see out of it. You know, wait, wait, there's not a window in the background. I mean, there's one, but you, don't, you know, that, that window can blow out a little bit more and you still have like a nice ratio. So it was a little easier in terms of just overall exposure. So you're always trying actually to keep some kind of balance to look outside to keep the yeah, exposure. Did you add stuff inside or were you actually just put trying to find right angles to light inside to get enough light in? No, this was all kind of, this was, I think this was an, you know, an Airy Max through some muzz, then you would take a reflector and bounce something else. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we would use two, probably two or three different sources to kind of create this one push in through these windows. And inside, we might have used a bounce here and there, yeah. or you know, uh, an LED tube or something for a little bit of fill or eye light. But I think it, more than anything, we were probably taking light away. Mm. Um, but to your point about moving lights around, I think it's so important to kind of just experiment and kind of take that time, that 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 couple minutes to just move it around, see what it, see what see what it's what it can do, because um, you kind of be surprised, you know. It's, it's crazy, right? Because it's, it's actually just a few minutes to do it. But the inner peace you need, how is that for you? How, how do you f figure out a space for yourself within yourself on set to have the calmness to say, you were talking about this earlier, how important it is for you to look what's happening and some maybe happy accidents happen that you then catch on to. How do you create the safe work environment for yourself that that creativity is still there and you don't feel the pressure just of... It, it's, it's hard to create that. You have to remind yourself even when you're in those moments that you're like, you are in control of what you're doing, but you, know, you, you have to kind of not be aware that there's sometimes 30, 40, 50 people around, around you while you're kind of working this out. You know, I kind of constantly talk to directors about that. Like, hey, if, something's, if, we're, if it's not feeling right, let's just take a moment and like really step away or change it up. You know, and, and, and we, we have the time to do that. You don't feel like it because you're always up against the day. There's all this pressure to kind of make the day, but ultimately these, these images live on. 
the project lives on, these images live on, and, and kind of, you know, as a director and a cinematographer, you're the ones that kind of are living with it the most, I suppose, or have to answer for them. <laughs> and so to take that time to say, oh, let's actually put our key light on the completely other, other side of the room than we initially thought. Even though we might not think there's time to do it, there is time to do it. You know, so I think it's just, you know, it's having been in these experiences so many years, I think. Um, but it's the confidence, I guess, to just to change it up and know that there's always a way out of it. But sometimes you have to make a, a hard right turn on a situation, whether it's a camera angle, camera platform even, like what kind of movement you're doing or lighting to get what you want if it's not working. You know, I think so, so much of the time you try to just kind of fight, not fight, but you try to work through in, on this one approach where maybe the answer is this other approach. But it does take, it feels like a freight train coming at you sometimes when, when everyone's looking at you and, and you're just, and it's very obvious you're completely changing what you were just doing. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, that's where, that's where the quality comes up because like you mentioned earlier, it's about it has to feel right, right? Mm -hmm. And if that feeling that isn't there, then you just got to move on and, and test something else. How do you communicate with the crew? Because obviously a lot of times it's this strange, I think, very wrong feeling of professionalism. I know what I'm doing. I'm placing it here. It's going to stay here. That's, that's not in the intention of creating good stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think... You know, I've been fortunate enough that, uh, you know, my camera crew's been working with them now for a long time. Um, same with a lot of my gaffers. And so, you know, anyone kind of a new crew member or department head I work with, especially depending on who the director is and how much of this kind of uh, discovery we're going to have, we j I just try to kind of be up front during, during our prep process or even, even the morning of and say, listen, just kind of hold on for this ride because we, you know, we have to be flexible we have to be willing to change the game plan and change the approach. And, and that's, that's my vibe, I guess. I don't know. I mean, that's just, it's interesting because um, one of my, um, Jeff Stortz, who's a, a focus puller I work with a lot, you know, I always kind of, you know, the, the whole thing where you're kind of changing lenses, trying to figure out what your shot is, he's like, let's change it again. He's like, do you want it? Because he'll, once, once he puts a lens up, if he kind of sees my face, he'll like, do you want me to change it to another lens? Like he literally would just know instinctually in my body language that I'm not, ha and he's like, we'll change the lens, it doesn't matter. We'll change it, we can go back to the one you just had on. You know, that idea of like just full support of like, you need to make time for discovery. Um, but it's hard, because you're also managing your entire day. And so you know in your mind, if you kind of take this 30 minutes here, you're gonna have to kind of make up for it somewhere else. But isn't that what leading's about? Having this crew and, and having your vision, where you want to go, and kind of make sure that everybody's behind you and trying to help you. Uh, do you communicate with the electricians as well? Or is it just your gaffer and, and make sure that he communicates to everybody? Nobody's going crazy in here, even if we're changing it for maybe <laughs> second time. Huh? Sure, I think if anything, I will, um, I mean, mainly just talk to the, the department heads, the gaffer, at key grip operator first AC but I'm very much aware because I kind of I, I kind of started in grip electric or as, a, as an electrician and so I will um, I will communicate that I, I, I feel their pain on certain things or you know I will just make sure that I, I kind of speak with everyone I think on the set if, if we're if it's getting getting a little wild or something like that I guess or just you know um, um, I have empathy for them you know because we were all there at one point <laughs> I think it has so much to do too that they know that everybody understands where they're going towards. Maybe that's a good part to go back a step and have a look at the stuff you prepped before the movie. How much do you communicate those visuals that you come up with ahead of time? Is that something you talk through with your gaffer? You see, whatever. You know, I, you know, I hadn't, this was the first film I had shot in probably six or seven years. I've kind of been working more in the commercial space. Yeah. And so, because this film was so important, just I think to everyone involved, I was very vocal with the kind of with my gaffer, with my camera operator, in terms of check out these references, watch these films. This is the intention. I kind of I did a I felt like I did kind of a slow burn to bring them all into the process. I would first kind of talk to them for a couple hours on the phone, then I would send them a script, then we would talk some references, then I would have them watch some movies for certain things, then we'd kind of talk about it. 
and just and I would kind of relay the the conversations that I've been having with the director about just kind of the intentionality about what we were trying to do or like a certain weight we were trying to get or a texture or like just so when you get to set everyone's more aware of the film you're all trying to make together you know <laughs> yeah. no, absolutely want to talk a little bit about the images yeah one of the things you know I think when you're getting handed a Western there's such a you're separate you're stepping into such big shoes I think as a cinematographer because there's just the this this is plethora of just these amazing westerns. You know, every generation has these westerns. I feel like kind of going back to the '40s, even. And so, you know, it's a real challenge. It's a real kind of call to action, I guess. It's just you're stepping into really big shoes. And so, for whatever reason, I I went down this. For, I I just was really curious, trying to find images that were as close to our film as possible that were actual photography of the time period. And so that kind of, I mean, I spent probably a week, a week and a half, just like diving down this rabbit hole of this kind of, of these, of these photographers and, this, and these, um, these portraits and these photographs from the, t from the time period. Because I really kind of wanted to look, look past them and, and, and get a sense of what kind of lives these people lived. I feel like that was really important to try to understand you know, to understand what it would have been like to live in the middle of nowhere in 1906. Because that, that's what I think what you really feel when watching the trailer we did right now. It's not so much, oh, this is a Western. It's about humans, you know, faced with humans in, in, in nature. What it, what it was at the time. I think that's the most emotional thing that, that got me the most from the impact. That's, that's really about people just, just fighting in some kind of environment they put themselves into. Yeah, I mean, we were really trying to get this authentic, this really just, and I wanted to cut through everything, you know? And so I was really, um, I don't know, I was drawn to it, I was called to it, I, I, you know? So there's a scene in Dead Poets Society at the very beginning where Robin Williams is like speaking with this freshman class and they're all looking at this wall of photographs. And he kind of talks to this idea that photographs can speak to you, that you can speak into what these photographs are saying back at you. And he goes like, look, in their eye, look into their eyes, see who they are, because they see you. That's kind of like the gist of that, that kind of sequence. And I remember going through these photographs, and I was, I was trying to kind of capture or just kind of connect to these people and these lives from like 120 years ago. It was really important. So these are just really pictures out of that period. These are, yeah, this is like, you know, Oklahoma in like 1906. And it was just, like, so I would sit here and just kind of overanalyze this, <laughs> you know, and just kind of like imagine for a second what their daily life would have been like. Yeah, I really like the idea they're looking back at you. Is that something you think about when you're filming too? That those persons looking at you, they're doing what, the, what it's going to be like for the audience afterwards? I don't know if I go into that. I think it's more of an instinctual, mm. or like I, I think these are like instinctual choices that you make on the day of production based on kind of all your all your prep that you've done, mm. and so there'll be these like these decisions that would be made on set that I wouldn't even probably realize would maybe go back to this photograph. Maybe there was a a chair, you know, in this door right here, and so I would I would go on set and move a chair a little bit that way, you know, and so it's all kind of this like. It, you know, it all just kind of created this library to kind of pull from on, on a subconscious level, I feel like. What's the painter? This is Andrew Wyeth. Um, and I had been somewhat familiar, but I, w I definitely rediscovered him during the prep of Old Henry. And it was interesting because there was this spring house that we have in the film, or on location. I never quite understood it. And the director kept saying like, oh yeah, we're gonna have him go get water from this thing. And I was like, I don't see it. I don't know. It, it was always something that I couldn't, I couldn't come to terms with visually, and then I, and then in stumbling across this, this, you know, kind of reintroduced to this painting, I was like, I, I stumbled across this image, and I was like, so then I sent this to the director, and the production designer, and then we ended up getting these, these kind of these milk, these milk containers. We actually got them for our film. You know, she was able to source them, and then we kind of put that, put that in the film. So that's kind of a reference that. You know, this painting definitely inspired, you know, some of the art direction and, and kind of this one in, the, in one of the sequences. It's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, what, he, what he highlights so well is that cinematography is not just about the lighting and the camera and, f and basically filming something that's there, but it's an immersive process 
of all the stuff that's happening within the set, like you're saying you're moving objects or not f finding an image for yourself, but suddenly with a change in art department, the image starts to work for you. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I feel, and maybe it's kind of coming, I don't know if it's coming from the more of a commercial space where you, you're kind of having to kind of get on the same page with a new director maybe quicker, but I, I feel, at least in kind of my process or my, my idea of a cinematographer as a kind of a, a visual storyteller, I'm, I'm there to support the director from a visual perspective. And that means lighting, camera, location, design, maybe even story, you know, in terms of like bringing ideas visually to the project. And so as much as the director is willing to kind of go down that road or that path with me, I, I want to go down that road with him in terms of what do you visually want to see out of a project? Because it's not just limited to camera lighting. Um, on, you know, it, it can be anything from location to, to story elements or, uh, or things within there, you know, kind of that you want to visually see or visually bring to the project. Mm -hmm. That's why I too. That's, this is Wyeth as well, yeah. And one of the things I think in the, in the paintings and in the photography was I just felt like there was a sense of isolation in, in a lot of the kind of, in the, in the portraits. And I don't know, it's because like they all had to stand still for so long to not be blurry, <laughs> you know? But there, you know, there's just this kind of this isolation that happens and it was definitely a theme in our film. And so, yeah, I really was drawn to to Wyeth especially, because I feel like he kind of captured this idea of dis, I don't know, this coldness, this despair, this isolation, this kind of maybe this human condition, mm -hmm. you know, if you're kind of left, if you, if you were kind of in the middle of yeah. nowhere without a lot of people around you, which was such an interesting kind of topic of isolation to explore in a post-pandemic kind of environment too, which is interesting, because this film was not, you know, this, this script was written prior to the pandemic, but it definitely deals with themes that we all kind of maybe had to grapple with a little bit over the last kind of couple of years about a sense of being isolated, not connected to the world. What's your relationship to nature? I, I feel like I'm constantly inspired by nature. Uh, I feel like I kind of have to constantly be surrounded by it. Um, I think it recharges me. Um, I think it's part of my work in terms of when we are outside or when you're doing exteriors to really kind of try to capture it in an, in a, an emotional way that makes you feel something I feel like that's really important. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm always on the search for, for, for an image that makes me feel something emotionally, um, not just kind of capturing it. Yeah. And it's so interesting what he said, because it's even if like, for example, you're trying to add something into that, like you're saying you have a feeling for the pandemic of isolation, and then you can adapt that that feeling to the images that you're trying to recreate. That's that's I think actors do it, right? It's emotional memory some way. You kind of add something into that because you feel it in the stuff you do. There's 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 just a power in there that's sometimes hard to describe. It goes beyond capturing something. Yeah, yeah I feel like I, especially for. For this, for, for old Henry, one of the things that during prep I kind of latched onto was, and it was something that wasn't, I don't know if it was necessarily on the page, but I was, there was, it's interesting, I feel like there was some, some horror elements in it, and in, 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 in just in terms of these people being isolated, and then this kind of, this darkness and this evil approaching. And so even though it's represented by these characters, Steven Dorff and his kind of and his and his gunslingers for me just on an emotional level I wanted to feel like this kind of evil uh, um, Approaching the cabin and the house and so that that definitely was an inspiration to a lot of how I film some of the earlier kind of just landscapes and and kind of I guess B-roll type stuff or establishing shots, I should say. I was always trying to think of like, what is the, what is the framing? What is the camera movement that kind of makes me feel something? Not just, oh, here's morning sunrise, you know. Like even in one of the early scenes, we added a bunch of like fog, because I was, I was like, well, this will just feel a little eerier this way. It'll f make you feel something, draw you in a little bit more. Because early, you know, in that first act of the script, there's not a lot of conflict, and so I wanted to bring a visual. Uh, 
conflict to it as much as I could. No, absolutely. How do you work with the script? Is that something that you read, like f you know what's happening the next day? Or how is it that you kind of get that into your system? With, you know, because you're shooting over such a long time and then it's patches of stuff you're shooting not to lose track of that one arc. Yeah, I think it all comes down to prep. Mm. And you're never given enough prep, mm. just in terms of like, you always can do more, you always can do more. And so this film, I had such a close collaboration with the director where we just knew the film inside and out. We knew, we shot listed 98% of the film ahead of time on location with a viewfinder for days. You know, we would act it out for each other. So we just knew exactly where the film was going. And then we made, we you know, we would just take lots of notes during the prep process. And so we constantly had these kind of spreadsheets that we would reference and go back to. So that, that was a big thing on this, I think, where I had a kind of a visual library that I was, or references that I was, I was using, as well as kind of these notes. Like we had our shot list, but then I had a companion to that, which was just random ideas, feelings, thoughts for certain things. And so during prep, I would be like, you know, be like, oh, scene 33, like, jot down some notes, you know, outside of, outside of lenses, lighting and stuff, but just random, random thoughts. <laughs> and you went back to those during shooting. And so we would just, yeah, if, 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 if something wasn't feeling right, or I would try to remind myself, like, oh, during a lighting setup, oh, let me just look back and see, I'm not forgetting anything. Um, so interesting, okay, wow. Because I, th I think in prep, and when you read, you've got, you know, you're can be overwhelming all these ideas and then yeah I think it I just I just try to be more organized about it on this one mm. you know than uh than any of my previous projects I suppose mm. 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 interesting changes so much what you said about that your kind of work is about the whole visual approach and now looking at the images it's it's so much more than just looking at the lighting or the framing to get some more immersive thing yeah, I feel like that was not even what I, you know, when I kind of go, at least on this project, the visual references were not really for lighting or, you know, yeah, like you're saying lighting or color, it was just a, a feeling and then trying to hold on to that feeling throughout the process. And so when you're going in and you're testing lenses and you're doing camera tests, how you emotionally respond to that, or I guess I should say like, I was looking for that same thing. I was looking for that same emotional response in those camera tests and those lens tests as I was getting from these images. And so I was in a constant search for that. And what were the tools and the tools and the kind of techniques, I guess, to get there? Yeah, yeah I'm just, I'm also a really big kind of history fan. So, or just a history, like I enjoy immersing myself in, in worlds. You know, I think we maybe all do as filmmakers or cinematographers, and so this was just an amazing, amazing opportunity to really kind of create something from scratch, I guess. Create a world that yeah. wasn't there, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you kind of tend to um, look at other films to do that, or you kind of try to stick to paintings and pictures to be not too close to the film world? I you think it was a... Stuff? For the for me on this one it was a, it was it was a process it was it, I think it started out of the uh, with the photography and the painting and then I think as a filmmaker and and as a cinematographer you know it's I think it's a great ex it's a great excuse to go back and watch a, a bunch of westerns you know and so or 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 any type of film you're kind of doing whether it's a sports movie you're going to go back and now this is an excuse to watch all these movies. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know if, you're, if I'm going after them for specific lighting and framing things or just this feeling I get from them, this emotion. Um, because at the end of the day, that's the only thing we really have to make a decision, right? You gotta, like you say, it has to feel right. And how do you build to that point where you actually can trust your feeling, what happens in prep, the pictures you do. You really see, yeah, you really see beautifully how that, how that sums up in your work. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a there's an author, Simon Sinek, and he has this book, know, know Your Why. Are you familiar with it? And so it's interesting. It's like as you know, know your why, right? Like know know the the singular purpose. If you have that answer, then if there's any kind of question or dilemma or debate creatively, you have that to kind of fall back on. And so maybe that was like instinctually happening, or just they're just a, a byproduct of, you know, looking at photographs for weeks on it. And I don't know. I just have to say it for myself. Guys, go on YouTube, go to TED Talks, go to Simon Sinek. 
There's a talk of him on the why, and it's basically based on companies, but I think it is so true for all of us to understand why do we want to do something, and it comes down to communicating, right? Your, your why, why do you want to do this, and how then to put it on. Yeah, it's crazy that you know this. It's like my big thing right now. <laughs> yeah, it's so important. Um, you know, it's like when you're ever in a dilemma, like a creative choice, it's like that will, that will kind of keep you on the path that you started out on, ideally. Or maybe change it, and that's okay too. And also it's about communicating, right? Because if you feel sh sure about why you want to do something, and it's just to go back what Simon said, it's not about what you're doing and how you're doing it, it's about why you're doing it. And that communicating that is, is, is really, I mean, just as a gaffer standpoint, if I know why you want to do something, I can totally click in. If you just tell me what, put a 20K there, I have no idea why. Right, yeah, 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 absolutely. That's a <laughs> And uh, yeah, just going back to watching kind of, you know, it's like a, it's a joy to kind of watch. And I, you know, it's interesting with the Western, there's so many different types of Westerns. You know, you've got these kind of American kind of Ford, Hawks, Westerns, and then you've got these spaghetti Westerns that were influenced from those, kind of turned on themselves, and then they were like, spun back to us. I think this is even Sam Raimi. I think this is from The Quick and the Dead. And so you've got Sam Raimi, like, uh, you know, you've got these films influencing films, influencing films, and now, you know, even recently you've got, you know, Tarantino inspired by the spaghetti Westerns, which were inspired by John Ford, and so you're just, it, it's just a constant building upon uh, the genre you know, in this amazing palette of films. And so I think to kind of find your place in that, you know, as a filmmaker and a cinematographer is pretty, pretty important. And I know one of the biggest things I took away from the more modern Westerns was a sense of, of texture. And so I, I, was, I, I definitely looked at Hostels, uh, Scott Cooper's film, because there was something about that. Obviously they shot it on 35 millimeter and there's something about the texture of that film that was, it was just spot on. It just puts you in this world and you didn't, you never questioned this world they were in. And so that was one of the things I spoke with the director early on about was, I was almost as wor just as worried of, of wardrobe, you know, and the costume design as the lenses because if, if all these different elements are not in place, you know, it starts to become inauthentic, you know, because I think there's some Westerns that you may be watching, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. It was just, it was just, how can this be authentic, or our version of what this authentic Western is? I think it's so true what you say, because if you just would be referencing movies, you'd be going down the rabbit hole of recreating, recreating, I'd be saying, you're going back to the base, what are those humans living right there? Look, go back to those original pictures. You're just cutting right through all of that and finding your own version of, of bringing these people to life no? on, on screen. Yeah. And I also find it really fascinating because it's such an American, uh, originally just an American art form, the idea of this Western, and the idea that in the 20s, you actually had gunslingers and kind of ex, kind of cowboy, ex bank robbers. I mean, you literally had bank robbers that were bank robbing things in the you know, late 1800s that then 20 years later would play themselves in a silent movie in Hollywood. You had members of the Dalton gang that were writer producers of some of these early Westerns. A lot of them aren't around now, but there's a record of these Westerns that have been made. And so it's, it's interesting that you've got these films that actually used these, these gunslingers, these outlaws in some of their films. Pretty fascinating. Absolutely, yeah. So awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank it's you so much for having me, Jacob. I really appreciate it. Truly grateful to meet you. Thank you.